the last of uh, this semester's public lecture series organized by the Faculty of Architecture of the Student Academy of Arts. And it's an honor to present tonight's speaker, Liam Young. Liam Young is, a, is an architect who operates in, in spaces between design, fiction and futures. Together with uh, Daryl Chen, he is the founder of the think tank Tomorrow's Thoughts Today. Um, Tomorrow's Thoughts Today is, um, is exploring the consequences of fantastic speculative and imaginary urbanisms. Um, and what they say of themselves is, um, is they see it as a legitimate model for an architecture practice. Um, a practice not built on buildings as endpoints, but on speculations and research as products in themselves. I think that is very ambitious and ambitious and, and interesting. Um, Liam Young has with the TTT, the Tomorrow's Thoughts Today, uh, consulted and conducting, conducted workshops on speculation, emerging technologies and future forecasting for companies including Oro Drivers for Change, Philips Technologies and BBC and also for the film industry and their arts and science organizations. He has also co-founded the Unknown Fields Division, which is an award-winning nomadic workshop that travels on annual expeditions to the ends of the earth, if one can say so, and, and explores the scenes behind the, the modern city. Um, he's currently teaching at the Architectural Association School in London and in SciArc in, in Los Angeles, and has recently been a visiting professor at Princeton University. Um, among other things, he also coordinates events and exhibitions, including the multimedia series Thrilling Wonder Stories, Speculative Futures for an Alternative Present. Uh, has been the curator of the Lisbon Architecture Triennale uh, 2013, and was named by the Blueprint magazine as one of the 25 people who will change architecture and design. Please join in welcoming Liam Young. Um, so that's very much what we do. 
Um, so across the crowd, last few years, we've based studios on a cargo ship traveling through Asia, tracing our technologies back to their sites of production. Um, we've traveled through the irradiated wilderness of Chernobyl exclusion zone um, to the Guatemala for the end of the world, or at least the end of the mine long count calendar, um, to the illegal gem fields of Madagascar um, that are cut out of Madagascan rainforests to the mining landscapes of outback Western Australia, um, to the Arctic ice shelf um, and the climate change landscapes of far north Alaska where the world's research scientists are out there collecting data that feed supercomputer models of the climate that then, then inform climate and ecological policy. Um, and then we, we've done things like we bought an old school bus um, off eBay for a road trip through the UFO conspiracy theory space reports and the freaks of the Burning Land Collective um, researching fictions of American black military landscapes. So we're interested in these sites and, and traveling to them as part of our practice because they're landscapes that are dealing with the immediacy of trends that we see emerging much more abstractly in a city like this or London or LA where I'm based. Um, so we travel out to these territories, we develop these projects in a way kind of mapping the complex and contradictory realities of the present as a site of strange and extraordinary futures. So we're really interested in this idea of getting out into the world to document it. Um, and it's in these spaces that we create these speculative projects and we really just tell stories through the practices of architects, um, tell stories about possible futures and launch them in a way that um, connects them to broader audiences. So our most recent expedition took us through Chile and Bolivia. Um, this is drone footage that we shot out there where we followed um, the evaporation ponds of the world's largest lithium mines. So this is the landscape behind the scenes of all of our batteries that, that power our cities, power our technologies. So 70% of the world's lithium is buried underneath this landscape. So if the future is electric, if the future is Elon Musk and his Tesla fuel dreams, then the future is buried here beneath the salt flats of Bolivia. And we traced our technologies back to the rare earth mines in Inner Mongolia where they begin their lives. So we collected material from this radioactive lake and made some of the first footage of this site that sits behind the world's largest uh, rare earth mine. We took the material to a lab to be tested. And this is this extraordinary lake that's made uh, from all of the technologies we own. And from this toxic mud, we made a series of um, Ming vases, each produced from the amount of toxic waste that is used in the manufacture of um, three objects of technology, the mobile phone, the laptop, and the electric car. So what we do, what we do is, is collage these um, real sites that we visit um, with the speculative architectures of film, fiction, and, and performance that are extrapolated out of them that I developed in my Urban Futures Think Tank tomorrow's thoughts today. So as I was described in the introduction, we explore these consequences of near-future speculative and imaginary urbanisms, and we, rather than make buildings, we use the techniques of fiction, film, and performance to deploy design speculations as imaginative tools to help us explore the implications and consequences of emerging trends and ecological conditions, but also to disseminate these interests and these ideas to audiences outside of the traditional constraints of architecture. This is the fundamental part of the work, you know, architects spend so often in rooms like this talking to each other. Um, we use fiction and storytelling as a way of taking those ideas out of these environments and putting them into the world. Um, 
So this film comes out of unknown fields research, but explores the implications of drone technology in the world. So it's the first fiction film shot entirely from drones, where we're exploring a world where um, drones monitor the wayward youth of a London council estate. And in the film we watch as a young girl um, has hacked and decorated her own drone and she uses it to pass notes to her boyfriend trapped in a council estate tower opposite. And like kids in an old fashioned classroom they kind of scribble messages with borrow and paper, they ball it up and they put it in their drones. So in this near future city, drones become both agents of state surveillance, but they also become co-opted as the aerial vehicles through which two teens might fall in love. So it's a way of thinking about um, the implications of this emerging drone infrastructure, um, imagining its cultural implications as well as its dystopian possibilities. And it's this idea of exploring, constructing, animating, and telling stories about alternative worlds as a means to understand our own world in new ways, which is what all the work is about. It's this idea of extrapolating the present and developing new stories where we exaggerate the world and we treat these ex expeditions we take through it like location shoots for a film to construct stories and to reveal invisible connections and phenomena. So that's what I want to do with my next hour, is really to go through one of these worlds, to go through one of these stories. And tonight we're going to travel through the emerging technologies of a near future smart city. So this is, um, it's actually um, a way of performing um, a new film that we've just developed called Where the City Can't See. And it's a film set in a fictional near future Detroit. And that's where we're going to spend the next hour. It's a film that is actually the first film shot entirely using LiDAR scanners or laser scanners um, that I'll talk about a bit more later. Uh, but these laser scanners are a new data technology um, uh, of surveillance and data acquisition upon which many of the smart city systems that we all talk about are actually based. So things like driverless cars, for example, navigate, see and understand the world through these LiDAR scanners which are positioned on the roof. So the film that we'll see glimpses of tonight follows a group of young kids who work in the factories of this near future Detroit by day, but at night they evade the smart city sensors and scanners through camouflage costumes and stealth architectures to go and travel to a hidden dance party. Because we're interested in this idea of how new technologies actually generate new forms of culture or generate new forms of cultural resistance, new kind of subcultures. So in the past, you know, the spaces of illegal rave parties, for instance, used to exist on the periphery of cities out of industrial zones where the police didn't go. But in a city, a near future smart city, where technology sees everything that we do, where do we find the spaces that the city can't see? Where do we find the spaces to do the things that we actually really want to do? So we're going to go on this filmic drive through the world of this film, through the world of this near future Detroit, or the, the world of this imaginary smart city that we're all very much on the close of, um, very close to inhabiting. I'm not going to screen the final film, but rather to tell this larger story um, as a way of expanding on all the kind of architectural research and ideas and concepts that go into um, the making of this film, and also as an example of the form of practice that we do, a practice called world building, where we construct worlds um, and then set narratives within them, a practice that we're um, uh, now kind of taking to LA and um, consulting the film studios and things like that to build these worlds of science fiction film sets. Um, we've just launched a, a new masters in fiction entertainment, literally a masters in this idea of world building to explore how architects can engage um, in this model of speculative practice. So we're going to take a tour through the city um, from the back seat of one of its driverless taxis 
And like I said, it's a city that will be stitched together from real footage that we've collected on expeditions um, and from short films that we've made exploring these ideas and from um, new projects that we've developed in this context with the studio, but also um, from a collage of clips that are found in the dark, dark depths of the internet. Um, so let's go on this tour. Um, so I do these lectures um, if we can get it working. Um, I, I do them as these kind of storytelling performances um, with live music visuals, um, live, live music mixing and visuals. Uh, there's a lot of technical shit that's going on on the laptop when I talk, and it generally works, but sometimes it will go horribly wrong. Um, not setting it up for failure or anything, but it's not a great start. I feel like I can't get it to work. There we go.
with gravity as a Google Earth satellite. And through the optical technologies of this hurtling mode of reflecting panels and heat shields and nanomaterials, the smart city looks down on the Earth and tiles together this digital planet on its surface. It's a data territory that binds the smart city together, a site that our taxi now drifts through. Speeding satellites, the Earth below reads its kind of blisters of light, constellations and pixels, the inscriptions of our technology's endless effects on the Earth's surface. So the magical realist Borges dreamed of the futility of a one-to-one -one map of the entire world, and in a way that is exactly what we've made through these technologies. And the map is the territory embedded with information and lay it across space like a city after the rain. So the resolution of this map that we're all so familiar with, that we all use to navigate through the city, a pixel is less than half a meter in scale, which means that it's just a bit bigger than the width of our bodies. So at this scale, our cells, we're just a discoloration or a dead pixel is thoroughly embedded in the grain of technology and indistinguishable from the city and the technology that surrounds us. So ancient craftsmen once measured the world using parts of the human body, the cubit, which is based on um, an elbow or an inch, which is actually the length of a thumb. And we once understood the city through systems that put ourselves or our own vision and patterns of occupation at the center of the structures that we designed. But in this light, our city, the body, is no longer the dominant measure of space. As we drive, the city points out a structure out the window, and in the distance we can make out a tracery of markings scored across the Earth's surface. It's not evidence of some ancient tribal culture or a forgotten relic of the Nazca lines, but these are the traces of the new tribes of the digital, the animal tracks of the orbiting machines above. So on the right, is a satellite calibration target. It's a machine vision graphic that's etched into the ground of the city and supports the precision this whole system relies on. So these patterns were created to give satellite mounted cameras something on which to calibrate their lenses. And the skin of the city becomes a digital test pattern. The primitive markings of an urban culture firmly on the rise. This is about the Sandy Island mystery that was in the city of Carroll. Sandy Island was actually um, found on a Google Earth. So as you travel across this pixel sea, we are like explorers in this strange land, and the city tells us this tall, salty tale of one of its less trodden areas. So just off the coast of the city is this island called Sandy Island. It's a collection of dark pixels, GPS coordinates, hyperlinks, and stories. Originally charted by a whaling ship Velocity in 1876, the island has long been what's called an evidence doubtful landmass. Perhaps it was originally recorded to trap um, uh, cop map, map copiers, or perhaps it's a mislabeled pile of pumice that was floating on the ocean, but this apparition remained visible at Google Earth until an Australian research vessel confirmed its non existence during a 2012 expedition to survey the ocean floor. So up until that point, to a world of Google explorers and hyperlink adventurers, the island was just as real as any other place they visited online. So if the places and spaces exist in the mediums through which we experience them, then they become just as real as any other. One-to-one -one digital model of the world, and the 
pixel is the territory and the driver's car is our best friend. The city transports and smiles and ingredient server racks and silica. And like early web crawlers, we now traverse the city into the streets and driverless taxis. We're collecting data. We're feeding the city because just like Google, the smart city uses driverless cars to ground through its maps and correlate the data collected from the satellites above. So our car is scanning the landscape. It's shooting out a laser a million times a second, reflecting off the world and rendering it as a point cloud. The complexities of the city has evaporated into this kind of coordinate cloud. And through its machine vision, the city and its fleet of driverless cars identify markers. They reduce detail and complexity to recognizable forms and figures and processes so that they don't run over a dog in the street or an old lady crossing the road. And these are the creatures that our city is remaking itself for. Not our own vision and sight lines and patterns of occupation, but now we just sit in the back seat, hands off the wheel, and the city is driving, and we're effortless passengers through the city machine. Now, when the ships dock, 
they're not meant by able-bodied semen, but by unmanned quartzite cranes driven by these same company algorithms. These autonomous creatures roll across the tarmac surfaces of markings and painted lines. Their operators, the ship captain, just passengers in the machine, their bodies repurposed as a component in the landscape scale robot that stacks the containers ready for transport, bringing out goods all the way from. So these are the human machines of the smart city, orchestrated by efficiency algorithms. These are the real robots that are new seeds of technology. The parts per minute, defects identified, the body matched in speed to the conveyor that turns in front of us. This is us in the smart city, where any meaningful moment can somehow be counted and measured. And the efficient city is hungry. It feeds on data. It is, in a way, our data, crunched up and fed back to us like a dog eating its own stick. These infrastructures of the digital world, things that we think of as being effortless or of the cloud or designed with seamless edges and um, almost effortless, edgeless glass, actually have extraordinary implications on material experience. So these are the architectures behind the screen and beyond the fog of the smart city cloud. These are the physical outputs of our digital engagement with the world. So this collection of post-human architectures and spaces reverberate across multiple frequencies, across multiple forms of sight and experience. In our city, the terms virtual and real no longer apply. So the efficiencies of the new, smartest city are born out of these processes that began their lives in the mind site and in industry. Gathers information from a wide range of sources. Video cameras monitor buildings, streets, and playgrounds. Gunshot detectors alert police in real time. The city's rhetoric of efficiency, of problem solving and engineering has been scaled down from industry to urban life. And as we drive from the periphery to the city centre, our ringtone symphony echoes through the streets and we're all vibrating, chiming and chirping. The city looks us over, are you a customer or a citizen, it says. It finds such questions difficult and with a million sensor eyes it glares at us the same detached gaze as it does the production line. And it's sold to us through these cute icons of urban life, these simplified flowcharts, taglines, and marketing speak. Today, in a single second, more than 100 financial transactions are made, 1,500 posts are made, 8,000 tweets are tweeted, 46,000 searches are made, 100,000 videos are streamed, and a staggering of 2.3 million emails are sent. All of that through the network. Millions upon millions of kilometers of copper and over 2 terabytes of fiber optics, pumping over 4 zettabytes of data stored in the cloud. Inspiring innovation, building and developing business, and empowering people's lives. The network is the vital foundation of our ultra-connected world. Now this is only the beginning. In the future, you will need to be so much more. It will respond, learn, and scale to your business needs. It will overcome constraints and disruptions to allow your business to succeed. This network won't slow down, pause, or disconnect, allowing constant connectivity, any place, any time. From an isolated village to a bustling city center, whether on the move or on demand, free to access the things that matter. Flawless connection to make life run that little bit smoother to keep everyone smiling.
into the fog of the cloud and the magic of the control room. Have you met Lena? The city says excitedly. She's from 1972 Swedish Playboy, and she works here in the control room. Because Lena is the face that was used to define the early training set for every facial recognition algorithm that the world now still uses. She's a true ghost in the machine, and she's just one example of how the smart city technologies of scanning and understanding the world is not neutral or objective, but encoded into these rules of the smart city are a kind of racial bias, a Western privilege, ideology, and an agenda of simplicity and efficiency, but not for all. This is where the city lives, and perhaps this is where we all live. It's an ignored part of the city, but it is such an intimate landscape for all of us. So tripping the light fantastic and following the fiber, the city invites us in, and we arrive at the data center infrastructure that lies behind the scenes of the smart city. So this is the landscape of everything. All of our messages, photos, and name chatter, some ridiculous YouTube videos, hopes, dreams, desires, and darkest fears are here. And the electric car motors have given way to the whir of cooling fans. And in this network of anonymous rooms and machines scattered all around the world is where we keep photos, all of our culture. So at a time when our collective history is digital, this is our generation's cultural legacy, our cultural repository. And it's not a grand cathedral, it's not a great library, it's the endless server aisles of the data center. And perhaps we'll soon write soliloquies for the server aisles like we once did for Rolling Hills, where couples might steam up the car windows parked in the artificial moonlight of vast data complexes and power plant fog hangs heavy in the air, and we picnic under the sodium glow of a row of artificial suns. And with the city, we perhaps meet our digital selves in the server racks, and we watch us winking back in a million LEDs of Facebook blue, because this is in a way where we all live, or at least where our digital self are. Through the power plant fog, we see two kids digging for scraps of information, anything they can salvage and hope to sell on. Two of them are fighting over a morsel of text, and I see the face of a one-time film star, like a spectral mask that's floating in the air like insects. And looking back at the city skyline, we see the notice of ghosts rising from the outer regions. So many flickers of light, dots of color, notes of music, images, words, fragments that all drift towards the vast shining towers of the central city, the financial district, and the industrial landscape beyond. So you want a Pepsi, the soda machine asks. So 
So throughout history, the city has always stood quiet. And now we are making a world of living objects that listen, that watch, and talk back. And everything is connected to everything. And the rhetoric of the Internet of Things will make our lives better, fulfilled, and happy. And appliances hum, and the cooling fans whir, and LEDs blink, and babies drift off to sleep amid white noise lullabies. Our network coverage flickers, our animated worlds glitch and buffer as objects increasingly acquire lives of their own and the South Korean woman even got her own awakening when she left her robot vacuum to do the cleaning while she took a nap. The vacuum cleaner reportedly mistook the woman for dust, locked onto her hair and tried to suck it up. The vacuum suction was far from gentle and wretched the woman from her slumber. The woman's hair then became entangled in the cleaning device. The woman, who has not been named, was unable to free herself and call the fire department with a desperate rescue plea. So the fire department is called after a robot vacuum cleaner attacks a sleeping on his head. And Heinz Ketchup was forced to apologize after a QR code on a ketchup bottle linked to a hardcore porn site. Daniel Coral scanned the label on the bottle to read about the promotion and recipes but was instead directed to German porn site, Funderado. And after a worker left his programming job, colleagues discovered that he had written a series of scripts to automate his job, his relationship, and making coffee. One script sent a text message late at work to his wife and automatically picked reasons from a preset list of excuses. The city itself has an automated tweet it sends out every hour or so, like the chimes of a bell tower in an old village square. Yes, okay, it will all be fine, the city tweets, on the hour, every hour. And drifting above this sea, of neon haze, drones have become as ubiquitous as pigeons, and the sky is thick with an infrastructure of everywhere. The drones use the city data set to navigate. The citizens of the city adorn their drones now the, one, the way they once customized their phones. So in the city, drones, like all other talking connected smart gadgets, have become kinds of cultural creatures. And here above an audience drifts the tribal drone, rescued from the mosh pit of an outdoor music festival. Or the glam rock drone that forever clings to the hope of a 70s revival. Or the mirror ball drone. Or the Harajuku drone that's adorned in 2,000 phone shards. In the city, in the skies above it, we see a menagerie of drones that drift through the air. And as if dragging around their shouldered ghetto blasters in the 80s, a few kids have launched their own drone sound system, carrying speakers and live broadcasting the musical drones of John Cale and the Velvet Underground. It's a surround sound system that has taken to the air and is thrown across the city like a kind of drone orchestra. And the rumble of drone propellers becomes a new natural soundscape to the city of a new generation.
drones in the city now walk the city's dog population. Think of the time saving, the city says. Another drone armed with a dildo disrupts a Russian parliamentary session. zips overhead en route to attack a village in a country half a world away. We should follow the Amazon Prime drone that's zipping above us, the city says. We, should, we can follow it back to the Amazon warehouse. That's where we keep everything, says the city. And stretching out before us is the endless shelves and storage bins of the Amazon Fulfillment Center. So Amazon bookshelves are stacked based on a complex sorting algorithm engineered around sales frequencies and buying patterns. And we watch as Amazon robots rush through the stacks, navigating from book to book, filling orders by following the most efficient route generated for them by their navigational program. And this is the library of the smart city. It's not organized around the Dewey Decimal System, but by buying habits and aggregated data sets. So this is a library that isn't organized for us. It's a space organized by digital logics and inhabited by bodies repurposed as machines. be the physical world left behind when everything disappears into the lens of Google Glass or Oculus Rift. So we're intruders in these spaces that the smart city is remaking in its own image. And perhaps modern film studios are an analogy for the rest of the city, where we see a new kind of architecture or a new type of ornament that's based on calibration markers and targets and stripped back to become scaffolds and infrastructures for a digitally constructed world, an architecture that is lying in wait, ready for the premiere of a million animated movies that will illuminate its surface with color and detail. And the city is filled with the digital confetti, confetti of our desired world projected just for us. And this is the future the city promises. Smart city. Head 
opportunity is this 3D projection with a larger fan base than most living musicians. And the crowd waves their glow sticks for a digital ghost of a smart city. So Hesuni is the first animated pop star. Just like the Kardashians or the Hiltons or the bloggers and Instagram stars, she has no physical presence. She's just a media construction or a conglomeration of glistening pixels. Dude, come on. Very good, come on. And a YouTube cat video viral burst from the screen. And in the eyes of Google Glass Hole that skates across the floor, and the digital ephemera of the internet begins to fill our physical spaces. And the cat skateboards across the living room. No matter how many times we watch it, it's still just as cute. An empty room fills with the flood of a newscast that's broadcasting the latest tsunamis from across the ocean. And what was once trapped on our screens now fills the world and we begin to inhabit our own pixel dreams. with the tracking markers required to locate these animated projections of architecture, city, and ourselves. And now as we continue the drive in our driverless taxi, we've come to a traffic light. The city nods to the lights in acknowledgement. And every system is managed now and we see kids in the distance who have designed their own machine vision pattern ornamentation. And like the explosion of 80s subway street art, we now see a kind of calibration graffiti or augmented reality hackers that spoof urban space and throw off CTTV vision using their tracking markers that they've installed in the landscape. And they hack the reality of Google glass holes and they crash drones in the wall. So Google have already what we call view codes for about 6 million businesses and 20 million addresses. So you get, using logo matching, they scour the city, tagging with information. And the pixel city, the smart city, is encoded with information. Which means that a group of kids can reroute our taxi using fake signage and strange markings. They throw off the navigation systems of their taxi with their machine vision graffiti and they begin to take us to places off the map, places the city can't see, hidden between the point clouds. These are the alleys and the cracks in the pixels of the smart city. And all the ravers and graffiti kids now jump aboard our taxi. And they do their makeup using the gloss black mirrors of their dead screens. So facial recognition algorithms scan their faces in a city of cameras. The software searches for the city, searches in the city for the proportions of the face, but these kids adorn themselves in anti-facial recognition makeup, geometric forms and asymmetrical hairstyles that distort the face, creating a new exuberance in plain sight that's celebrated by the hipsters of the city, but in a way that they remain invisible to the eyes of technology, the eyes of the Detroit machine vision city. So the hipsters here reimagine their fashion cycles to follow the rate of Moore's law or the latest phone or software update rate rather than a change in season. And they develop new camouflage textiles, a new hoodie that's designed to be invisible to the scanning technologies of the smart city. And the iridescent textiles reflect the lights of CCTV laser scanners, creating these kind of exuberant glitches and distortions in the data set. And they become 404 areas in the city. And I can see them and we can see them, but the smart city can't. 
and they drift through the city unnoticed, just kind of distortions and anomalies in the data set. static and distortions and glitches become this new form of ornament and they celebrate the corruption of the body data by moulding within their costumery all the imperfections of a decaying scan file and layer by layer like a 3D printer drawing directly onto the skin they create this kind of physical glitch a manifestation of corrupt data in motion imperfect and distorted and always utterly take us through a network of stealth buildings and Google Street View anomalies and ghost territories. So the city uses these social recognition algorithms to blur out faces in Google Street View for privacy reasons. So these kids have built a collection of buildings designed for these systems where they make a building look like a face with the same proportions and identifiers as the machine it gaze reads. And then the building become these kind of blurs or apparitions, elusive, shimmering in a point cloud haze. And we create, we architect digital landscapes or conjured architectures of code, GPS tags, and metadata to be read and disseminated by machines, but experienced and inhabited by us. Architectures that might have a footprint or present solely in the GPS smart city spectrum. Would you like to check in at your current location? Sharing location on Facebook, Twitter, Force Choir, Google Plus, and MySpace. Digital cartographic landmark detected. These digital icebergs were launched yesterday, Wednesday, January 4th, and will reach the Chuchisi oil fields in 3 days, 14 hours and 27 minutes. Navigational disruption expected with 11 of 17 oil tankers in the autonomously navigated shipping lanes. Latter-day equivalent of the early explorers, using these satellite dishes to create false cartographies in our maps. We meet another group of children playing hide and seek in the Indian quarter of the smart city. And these kids have learned to hack the city's animated walls with a series of gesture controls. And just like when they play on the Xbox Connect, they engage with the city with the exaggerated movements of a silent movie. And they have learned some kind of hacking gestures, somewhere between sign language and Madonna Vogan, where they subvert the city through their play, hacking the city interface to open up its hidden, hidden service spaces and subterranean forest power plant, invisible behind the animated walls of the city. start to see that all of these smart city technologies are in one form 
start to control and make efficient all the complexities of urban life, but at the same time they then also start to create new forms of gaps, opportunities and agencies for the subcultures of the city. And LiDAR sensors, as well as being confused by camouflage costumes, can also start to be confused by sound and in particular bass tones that vibrate the sensors and throw off the lasers. And we're starting to head off the map now. And our taxi is driving through areas that's never been before. And people rally around these loopholes in the algorithm and groups organize around and through technology. They are part of a new community now, a community generated from these systems. So in the machine vision city, we are much closer to our virtual friends than we are to our physical neighbors. And in the city's past, out of the ruins of production line technology rose another global movement, that of Detroit Techno. So back then, an underground scene was reinvented the way that we listened to music, enjoyed, understood it, made it, and distributed it. It was made by a small group of pioneers, the, the children of those displaced by Japanese manufacturing who seized upon Japanese electronics to create this unique new sound. And finding hidden places amongst the ruins of the party, they got together and in the shadows of technology created a new subculture to then rapidly spread from Detroit to the emerging networks of the time and conquered London and Berlin and New York. So behind the city, behind the smart city icons and easy one clicks, new subculture is emerging from these new technologies. And our collection of young factory workers drift through the smart city point clouds in their driver's taxi. With us, they now search for a place they know exists, but that the map doesn't show. They are part of an underground community that work on the production lines by day, but at night, don themselves in machine vision camouflage and the tribal masks of anti-facial recognition to reenact their escapist fantasies in the hidden spaces of the city. They hack the city, and journey through a network of stealth buildings and ruinous landscapes and ghost architectures, searching for the wild beyond the machine. So we've always found the eccentric and the imaginary in the spaces the city can't see. dance and dance and dance and they developed a new choreography that throws off the scanners that's looking for the proportions of their body so they move with strange asymmetrical jerk movements so the body themselves start to disappear and can no longer be legible and they start to shimmer like ghosts in the city
program is a computer program that outputs Hello World on a display system. It's a super simple program that's used to verify that a language or system is operating correctly. It's the first words that are spoken by a new system, by new software, by a new technology. And Hello World burns onto the screen, announcing itself, telling us that everything is going to be just fine. And in many ways, the smart city is already here. We aren't sure who asked it, asked it in, but we're certainly not going to let it leave. So the services of the city that were once public are now managed by these systems. So we're left asking, who is this city for? Because we know that the smart city is not future neutral, it's not universal, but as we can see, it's fraught with the same contradictions as ourselves. is not one that just kind of rushes over us like water. It's something that we all must actively shape and define, but in some ways ideology rarely evolves at the same pace as te te technology. So we need to equip ourselves with the same kind of critical dexterity about it to make smart decisions in our smart city. And my watch tells me about a coffee machine it just met. And the city wraps us in a warm embrace. And the LEDs blink and the cooling fans spin. And the streets are lined with sensors. The electromagnetics hum and it smells like it's gonna rain. Our faces are bright in the rolling glow of a rectangular screen. Aurora. And in the future, everything will be smart, connected, and make it all better.
everybody else is welcome. Uh, but you, you started with, the, with a quote from William Gibson, mm -hmm. and um, um, there has been an, an, um, an, um, has built up an argument in, in literary criticism and research, and, and that's very often or much based on, on the writings of William Gibson, and that the argument says that, that we can say that today the science fiction and realism have actually collapsed or augmented into one thing. That there is no, there is no distinction. That that the the kind of experience of the new, which was one of the most powerful parts of the science fiction, is has become the the everyday experience of of what of what you know other everyday lives. And how how do you? Well, your performance was very much about it. But that's I still tend to to ask: How much do you see yourself as as treating uh, treating the reality or dealing with Realism and how much do you see actually sort of projecting somewhere else in, in time and, and, and space? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, um, I don't know, I, I, I kind of um, think about the work we do as, as not science fiction, but as a kind of um, uh, tour through a sort of visionary present, right? Um, and I think that's um, in a way what contemporary Gibson novels are as well, right? Like that they're, you know, the early days of his novels in the 80s and science fiction stories at the time were all about um, projecting forward into some kind of 20 or 30 year future. Um, uh, because they talk about that that was kind of a, a reasonable length of time um, around which we could kind of conceivably speculate but not look too stupid about in a few years time when if we got it wrong. Um, and as you watch his career, books have become increasingly set closer and closer and closer to the present, to the point where now I would describe that they're in this visionary present that I'm talking about. And he describes it because, just like you're saying, that there are now so many kind of unknown balls in play, um, you know, environmental collapse, um, economic uncertainty, um, ubiquitous technologies, biotech, um, and we don't know where any one of these things are going to fall. Um, so the length of now that we have to kind of realistically rely on without looking stupid is really, really short. Um, what it means is that an exploration of the visionary present is, is super critical because we need to be testing out all of these ideas and exploring um, their possible implications, not in any kind of form of prediction, um, but as a way of somehow shaping them or steering them into hopefully productive and preferable directions, right? And I think that's really the nature of the speculative project or the speculative architect, I hope, is that um, we, um, that prediction is just a side effect of the work that we do. It's much more about um, using fiction as a tool to look back in on the spaces of the present um, to present these stories in ways that a larger audience can start to connect with them. And then hopefully that audience becomes somehow more informed or active agents in shaping their own more preferable futures, right? So I don't think it's about trying to predict it and get it right, but it's more about um, trying to create a scaffold that might enable us to make choices about the futures we want to live in. Thank you. I'm a bit curious about how you personally feel about these slightly dystopian future visions. Is it something that you would like to avoid or something that you rather look forward to as a cool place to be a kind of a <laughs> contrary <laughs> country? Um, uh, I mean, no, I think the, the, the certain things I'm sketching out are um, uh, we need to be really, really wary of. Um, the, the scary thing is that most of these things are already here in most forms, right? Um, so this is, this is less a kind of a um, scary, senseless, um, less of a sort of um, optimistic, hey, it's all going to be fine, but more of a sort of call to arms to say that um, you know, these technologies are here for the most part, we're carrying the infrastructure that supports these systems around with us in our pockets. Um, but these things aren't benign. Um, but we're, we're not as critical about them as we are most of the other things that govern our cities and spaces and cultures. Um, you know, we're much more 
passive consumers of technology than we are critical agents of it. Um, and that seems really strange, you know, and, and um, as these things increasingly rule our lives, they're no longer just entertainment systems or, um, you know, pointless ways to message our friends with silly faces and strange emoticons, they actually become the systems upon which um, fundamental parts of urban experience are based. We can no longer just kind of ignore them or, like, you know, wait for the new phone model to come out and stand in line to get it. Um, we need to be um, asking much more questions of these companies that are producing these things for us. And um, we need to be provide, you know, finding out ways that they can be more accountable to a public than to they are to their shareholders, right? So um, uh, I think there's extraordinary potential in these technologies. Um, I think that um, they enable the most wondrous and um, um, fantastic um, part of ourselves to become amplified and exaggerated and spread across the world. Um, uh, but they're also, like anything, open to misuse. Um, uh, and I think um, we're seeing the consequence of that misuse at the moment, um, uh, just purely because we're not being clever enough about them. What, in your personal ideas, would be the first step against everything that you just showed us? Um, I mean, we did. I mean, a lot of our projects are trying to explore um, these ideas. I mean, something like the Drone Orchestra project. Like, I wove that into the the narrative, but that was a real project that we did, where we built this flock of drones that had these speakers on them that flew right around um, our theatre, broadcasting music. Um, that sounds quite contrary and, um, you know, an object of um, entertainment as opposed to um, uh, critical technologies, but really what I was trying to do was explore the cultural implications of these things. Um, we did a project that preceded that one with drones called Electronic Countermeasures, where we put a bunch of Wi-Fi routers on board drones that drifted through the city um, broadcasting a pirate internet signal um, uh, that was an off-grid network. Um, it was kind of a file sharing system, so you could upload files and data and information. We did it around the time in Pirate Bay, and um, all those file sharing sites were being closed down, mega upload and such. Um, and it was trying to create this, um, this network that wasn't um, tied into the broader systems and networks um, of the city that we all have to buy into in order to make a phone call. Right? Um, so it was an exploration in um, a democratic form of network, I suppose. Um, so I think there are ways to use these technologies to actually do really interesting and exciting things. You know, um, we just need to know the rules of them. We need to be able to crack them open and kind of work with them. Um, uh, so much of these technologies are described um, by people as kind of magic boxes. You know, like we don't um, uh, know what's inside this, this beautiful, shining bit of... Um, mirrored glass, um, we hope it works when we turn it on, um, which means that it's, it's really difficult for us to kind of critically engage with it or use it for ways in which it wasn't intended by the people that sold it to us. Um, so I think one of the first steps is actually figuring out how these systems work and you know, teaching in architecture schools, coding courses, understanding software systems and actually starting to design and make our own tools from these things, our own apps. Um, our own networks and infrastructures that um, can actually counter the ones that are being um, sold to us. Um, but I also think that, like in the context of the smart city, we also just need um, policy makers and, and some form of governance that actually is structured around um, these smart city technologies. Because what we're doing, like I was describing in the story, is that um, uh, yeah, the whole lot of services that were once kind of funded and paid for by the taxpayer or at least were kind of voted on um, uh, as we elected governments um, are now being outsourced to, to these tech companies um, and no one voted for them um, uh, and they're not, they're not accountable to us um, beyond, um, beyond the shareholders so um, we need to put in place some kind of um, critical form of oversight for these companies because they're operating um, with the scale and force of nation states.
Thank you. Uh, very interesting. And, uh, and you are an artist, right? I'm an uh, architect. I mean, as an artist, <laughs> uh, do you see yourself maybe one day, when you grow old, uh, retiring in this, I would say, what I saw, that sort of like a romantic, but, you know, a big mega city uh, with all its, its smart part of it, or would you rather see yourself, if they do exist, um, in a small village somewhere? Um, yeah, no, I, I think that, um, like, the counter to, the, to these things that I'm talking about, the counter to these technologies is not the retreat to the hills, um, raise pigs, and grow cabbage, um, and live off grid, you know what I mean? Like all these kind of urban farm fantasies, um, this, this kind of myth of localism, um, I don't think is the um, reaction against this stuff that, that is in any way productive. Um, I mean, these, th this tech does, does do extraordinary things, right? It has enabled extraordinary forms of action and extraordinary ways through which we can now communicate and connect. Um, uh, it's also a hell of a lot of fun. It, it creates a world that I very much doubt we're willing to retreat from. Um, so any kind of critical future that, that imagines us walking away from it um, I think is a bit naive, and I don't think it's productive, because um, it's just not going to happen. Um, uh, and any kind of kind of cautionary tales of extreme apocalyptic dystopias that um, that forces that kind of um, kind of fear of the Walking Dead um, uh, end of technology um, isn't going to happen either. Um, the world doesn't work in those kind of massive disjunction, it's just kind of, um, it's too slow for that. So, um, I think it's much more interesting to look at how we can use these technologies and repurpose them and how they generate new forms of agency and um, new spaces for cultural engagement than it is to um, run screaming to the hills. Yeah. So yeah, I'll be, I'll be retired with, um, with a PlayStation 11 or whatever it is by then, um, uh, with my headset on immersed in um, uh, playing uh, Call of Duty. Sorry, I keep on blinding you with the reflective screen. Uh, hi. Um, do you also deal with the how? How oh, this kind of a city changes a uh, person, uh, people, and um, right now there's uh, in cinemas this movie called High Rise. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's an adaptation from the G.J. Ballard uh, book, and um, so when the industry evolves and all the technology, so it changes the person as well. And uh, right now, we all have cell phones, we have computers, we get much more uh, information more quickly, and uh, it changes our views. So, do you deal with uh, that kind of aspect, the psychological aspect as well, or just you know, with the um, architecture one? Yeah, I mean, I think that's in many ways our primary concern, right? Like. You can't separate um, culture from technology. Um, uh, we're primarily interested in how all these new technologies actually generate new forms of culture, right? So the Detroit film is about um, the subculture of music and, and dances. Um, the, the drone film that I showed a clip of in the little prologue intro um, is exploring how we can kind of um, still do what it is we do, you know, flirt and fall in love, um, whilst this drone network drifts above us. Um, uh, the exploration of um, the worker in the smart city is one that um, looks at, at the moment, how where we're being reduced to these kind of parts of a machine, right? You know, that um, we're just things that produce data. Um, 
or things that are told to do certain things by other machines, you know, the worker at the Amazon um, warehouse or the worker on the production line um, don't have necessarily any agency in that system. They're just one part of the component that's cheaper to, um, to run than um, to build a robot that would do their job for them at the moment, right? Like that, um, you might have missed it, but there was a, what we call the human conveyor belt, um, which was digging a hole in Madagascar. That was actually a, a, a gem mine um, in Madagascar. Um, there it's, it's cheaper to pay 40 guys to dig a hole spade by spade and pass it to the next guy and up out the other side of the hole than it is to um, maintain fuel um, a mechanical conveyor belt, right? Um, so the body's become one part in that system, and as, as more and more systems become kind of optimized and automated, um, the body becomes reduced in more and more ways. Um, uh, and it's not just kind of the Madagascan worker, it's also to a large extent ourselves. So um, I think that's um, something we all really should be thinking about is what, what it is that it's doing to us. Um, um, and what's our, um, what's our role within these systems and how we can um, actually find new forms of agency within them. I think that's um, really the, the greatest fight um, uh, of our generation at the moment. Um, uh, but yes, we're not, we're not really um, exploring new things in those terms. So, so can we say that um that with, within the new technologies, also the, the role of the architect has to change. That perhaps the, what we could say started from the Renaissance, where there was a finite object with a clear authorship, is not really the, in, uh, the main issue of, of architecture anymore. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about it earlier on today. Like the, I mean, I don't think that the architect in the traditional form is going to disappear. Um, but they're just going to become increasingly irrelevant. Um, um, but only, only as irrelevant as like the couture fashion designer is irrelevant, or the guy that designed the Louis Vuitton handbag is irrelevant. Like the world still likes these beautiful things, um, so architects are still going to be allowed to design some parts of the city, um, uh, but only for those that can afford it, and um, uh, only for those that care. Um, but while we, while we mess around making um, these beautiful houses or museums in the Middle East, the rest of the world is being made by someone else. Um, and if we're happy with that, with that then great. Um, but if we actually want to look at ways that, as an architect, we can um, play a more active role in the shaping and formation of cities, um, then we need to look at alternative forms of practice. We look, need to look at how we can kind of diversify and um, infiltrate a whole lot of allied different fields and disciplines, you know, I'm interested in the architect as technologists or the architect as filmmaker, the architect as storyteller, the architect as politician, um, uh, the architect as kind of consultant or software engineer or um, network analyst, um, you know, like I think we can parasitically operate within these different disciplines, um, not as a way of kind of dissolving the profession or weakening it, but as a way of strengthening um, our role in the world, you know. So, um, uh, I'm not um, anti-architect or anti-architecture. I still think that um, it's one of the most extraordinary um, educations that you can get that's left on the earth, and um, I think it's um, really powerful, the sorts of things that we talk about. Um, I think the great tragedy is that we um, study for so long and have such interesting conversations um, in echo chambers and we talk to ourselves, um, and uh, we're in the service of capital um, to such a large extent um, that we're yeah, being reduced to these kind of luxury items. Um, so yeah, totally, I mean, that's I think <coughs> what our role is as educators or um, people in, in academic institutions like this um, is to actually look for how we can explore what these new forms of practice might be or what a legitimate business model might be for an architect in this world of technology. Yeah. This, this is actually a, a very big question, and uh, I think everywhere 
where we, we really see that the field where the architect should operate or, and also could operate in, in order to be relevant is, is very, very wide. Uh, what would that mean for the education? Is that, do we need to teach different things? Is that possible to teach a variety of things so wide? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, what it means is that we're going to have to um, start to um, diversify and specialize at certain points um, in the process. Um, I mean, architects have always found ways of, of um, ending up in, in different disciplines, right? Um, um, but it's always been an, you know, an individual kind of endeavor or journey to try and find ways to, to legitimately operate and to pay the rent um, in these different areas. And I think what we need to start to do is formalize some of those paths um, to legitimize them um, as real kind of um, career opportunities um, and to kind of, you know, what does a studio look like which is solely based in um, planning policy? You know, um, uh, or the, the studio that we're running at SIOP now is um, training um, the next generation of game designers and production designers for film, um, the next generation of storytellers. Um, uh, you know, we all kind of think that as an architect we can do that, but I think we should be kind of creating forms of um, course and program and specialization, postgraduate or masters or whatever that um, uh, equip us with the tools to, to actually launch into these um, allied disciplines. I wonder, how, um, or what do you think what the future of the human space would look like if, um, if this, or how the space would be defined, or how it would look differently? Because we partially talked about the, mm -hmm. the edginess or the tagging, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm really interested in this idea of kind of post-human architectures, which is what, like, like I was trying to describe that. You know, so much of our built environment has been based around our own patterns of occupation, the way that we see the world, or um, the proportions of our body. But when the dominant systems that occupy space are no longer us, right? It's the driverless car that shapes the city, not um, uh, you know a horse and carriage, or a pedestrian, or um, the you know the human driving um, car of um, the last century, um, how do we remake our cities on the basis of that pattern of vision? Um, I think it's, uh, it's hugely interesting, right? Like, um, there's certain forms that I was describing that, that machines can see really well, right? Like, because of these systems, these rules that we've encoded into them, um, they see contrast really well, they see corners really well, but seamless surfaces and curvilinear structures of, um, of parametricism, um, uh, it doesn't do so well with, right? So does that mean that there's a whole lot of driverless cars that are gonna be crashing into Zaha buildings in the next 15 years? Um, uh, I don't know, maybe we have to cover Zaha buildings in these calibration markers that you see in these green screen stage sets in order for a system to actually see them and be able to avoid them. Um, uh, you know, what does it mean for kind of new material systems? Like when we um, now design not for the permeation of um, natural light, but for Wi-Fi signals, you know? Like I'm interested in this kind of mode where London, the city where I'm from, um, you know, basement flats are really, really cheap because they're dark and dingy and um, there's no light. Um, but maybe the thing that starts to drive their prices down is actually the fact that mobile phone reception in, in them is really shitty, you know, and that becomes 
uh, more of a driver of um, property price. Um, we start to look at um, planning forms of cities that are based on satellite sight lines um, as opposed to traditional zoning regulations which are about letting light into the, to the street at ground level. You know, like, I think that, um, uh, you know, I can keep on going on, like all of these systems um, fundamentally change the parameters around which we design and build space. Um, they change the materials with which we build them from. Um, uh, so we've won a, a kind of a machine, a machine vision studio which has been looking at um, how these systems start to change the nature of what architecture is. And my analogy is that um, uh, green screen movie set. Because um, uh, in many ways when so much of our experience of the world is, is the screen um, and then in turn that screen becomes Google Glass or virtual reality or augmented reality or iris implant, whatever it is, um, then you know, architectures cease to be solely based around physical materials. They then start to be about pixels and um, animations and um, virtual objects that exist in space with just as much um, meaning and consequence as uh, physical objects. You know, like that, that library, not library, no, sorry, the island I was talking about, um, this place called Sandy Island is a great example. Like it's, um, for, it, it existed on Google Maps until this Australian ship um, undiscovered it. Um, it was a set of pixels and that's all it was, but um, ships would reroute around it and sh shipping lanes would avoid it for all intents and purposes because all the systems we use to navigate use these digital maps. Um, if something exists on the digital map, then it, it exists in real life. You know, um, uh, so that was just an accident. What does it mean to actually design that pile of um, black pixels? Um, how can we make architectures that have as much consequence um, in the physical world as it does in the virtual world? Like, I'm sure you've all heard those stories of. Um, uh, like when a guy, someone's been driving in a car, they haven't been paying attention, they've just been listening or reading or watching their GPS device um, and end up driving off a cliff or off the end of a bridge that hasn't been finished or driving into a lake because their GPS told them to, right? Um, uh, you know, like we, we kind of blindly understand the world through these technologies so you can find architectures that um, might be sighted just within the space of the screen, um, or within these technologies. So, you know, I can keep going on, but the, um, the interest in these kind of architectures of these technologies, I think, is, um, is really important, and we need to start to um, be exploring that new space of design. At the beginning, you also showed pictures or like movie clips about Chernobyl exclusion. So, what about uh, what about that? What if the nature takes over? What if the nature takes over? Yeah. What if the nature takes over? Um, uh, yeah, I don't think we're going to let it. Um, uh, I mean, I think you're getting new forms of nature, which are really interesting, right? Like. Um, uh, what's happening is that, um, I mean, technology has always been a driver in evolutionary change. It's always been a driver in nature. Um, and now you're getting really interesting moments where certain species are adapting to um, our own um, constructed spaces in a way that is um, uh, so fundamental that if you took away the city, um, they would no longer be able to survive. Um, and I think that's <coughs> the that's the continuum of nature um, that it will keep on going on. Is um, the line between technology and nature will become increasingly blurred, um, where you can no longer say that nature is kind of taking over um, uh, because it's all just kind of one messy soup of stuff, right? Um, the the idea that nature as some kind of rare and untouched thing um, 
uncontrolled by um, human experience or technology, I think is um, is one that died quite a long time ago. It was only it was only ever culturally constructed anyway. Perhaps um, uh, you know isn't really that term isn't really useful anymore because um, so much of nature is um, bounded and structured by the system that we've designed. Um, it is going to be more of that, I think. Right now, now um, cities are watched as hotbeds of evolutionary change by biologists because the processes of adaptation are so fast. Um, uh, it's a place where you can see almost like the Galapagos playing out in, uh, in a much shorter time scale. Um, uh, yeah, so, so no, I don't think it's going to take over. I think it's just going to... Um, um, become much more blurred and embedded in the systems of technology that we're talking about. I've got two questions. One is uh, moving towards that condition of um, the post-human. Um, is there, um, in those near futures, uh, any such thing as public interest? Um, and, and the other question is that also um, moving towards this uh, post-human condition and, and those near futures, or just thinking about those near, near futures, uh, what are the challenges um, uh, launched at our political system? Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, I mean the answer to the to both questions is, is, is perhaps similar, right? Like that. Um, the rhetoric around these technologies, as I was describing with those kind of cutesy icons and diagrams, is public interest, right? Like, it's gonna make everything better. I mean, the machine drone at the end of the talk was this um, line that's, that, that comes out of so much of the smart city material, propaganda material, um, which is that, you know, it's gonna make us all happier, and our lives better, and it's gonna make everything easier. Um, uh, so it's all sold to us in the guise of public interest. Um, uh, but there's obviously a, um, a pretty extraordinary flip side to that. Um, so um, I think the, the, the answer to that, the solution to that, is, 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 is kind of embedded in your second question, that um, we need to start to figure out ways of um, governing some of these technologies and certainly some of the companies that provide these technologies. You know, like uh, we were talking about this afternoon, the idea of um, you know, a, a highway or a road, for instance, was a piece of infrastructure that um, was supported by the taxpayer, right? Which meant that if it didn't work or a piece of the road broke up or there was a pothole after a storm, you could call someone from the council and they would come and fix it. Um, one of the most fundamental infrastructures of the contemporary city is the fiber optic network. And that's an infrastructure which isn't um, supported by the taxpayer, it isn't um, put in place by governments, but it's kind of owned, it's proprietary, it's owned by um, a small cluster of telecommunications companies and tech companies. Um, so this infrastructure that we fundamentally rely on to do everything that we do is um, no longer a public service. Um, so we need to develop um, the same kind of um, forms of critical oversight and governance around these new infrastructures um, as we once had with the old. Uh, and that's really, really urgent, right? Like, but, it, but the problem is that these systems came um, and were born out of a series of um, technologies that began as being quite benign and um, small scale um, uh, and kind of inconsequential for the most part. You know, we used, like I said, we used to um, kind of message each other and play video games and stuff, but now these same technologies are the foundations of so much of what we do, they're the foundations of how we buy things, um, how we bank how we communicate with one another, um, they can no longer afford to just be seen as things that you can buy into if you want them. Um, they're things that we rely on 
um, the things that everyone needs to be able to afford, not just um, uh, you know for someone that um, can have the latest um, iPhone. So um, there needs to be some kind of shift where these these things move from being um, private enterprise um, to being governed. Um, and I don't know what that shift is or when it happens, but um, uh, it's, it's quite urgent. Um, and that, in a way, it starts to then speak to um, how they truly start to operate in the public interest. No more questions. In which case, thank you so much. Thanks, guys.